are fortunate to have Sue Johnson today from the Olmsted Medical Group that is going to tell us about the history of uh, the Olmsted uh, Medical Group. Two of my children were uh, born at the Olmsted Hospital. Uh, we lived in the old Olmsted edition and my wife uh, delivered our first child in four hours and they told us that uh, she's going to be quicker the last time. The second time we went, and we went to St. Mary, which was a fair drive from where we were, and the, the second one took 20 minutes. So we were glad that we only had to go four blocks, and they did a wonderful job. So uh, I, without further ado, I'm going to uh, give you uh, Sue Johnson, who is going to be uh, telling you about the history of where two of my babies were born. Thank you. <laughs> decided to come out on this snowy day. I was thinking about that this morning, wondering how many people would say, I am not going out in this weather. It's beautiful or something. So I thank you for, for attending. I am going to talk about the history of Olmsted Medical Group and Olmsted Community Hospital, which now are known as Olmsted Medical Center. My name is Sue Johnson, and I am an executive assistant in administration. I actually work at the main clinic location downtown. And uh, I actually stumble sometimes, we were just speaking about the histories and there are times I stumble to say Olmsted Community Hospital. It is sometimes hard for me to say that anymore because it's, you know, I actually arrived at Olmsted Medical Group eight months before we merged. And so I only had eight months history of the Olmsted Community Hospital, Olmsted Medical Group, and, and then we merged it. And we are, we are definitely trying to get people to understand we are all one all one organization. We've been associated since the beginning, as you will hear from the, the history. Uh, we, we define it as Olmsted Medical Center Hospital, Olmsted Medical Center Main Clinic, Olmsted Medical Center Byron, whatever. So it's all Olmsted Medical Center. Um, things have definitely smoothed out. I was explaining that I had come right before the merger and, and things were a little rocky than the administration because we were taking a, a private corporation and merging it with a county hospital. And, and that was a very, very tricky thing to do. And I said, if I can survive those eight months, I can survive pretty much anything that Olmsted Medical Center will give me. Um, in 1947, the community leaders had a vision of a community hospital for non male clinicians. And in 1949, Dr. Wente envisioned life as a general practitioner in his wife's hometown. No one knew what those visions would become. The story of Olmsted Medical Center begins like most stories, once upon a time. At the end of World War II, there were only three physicians in Olmsted County who were not employed by Mayo Clinic. Some of Mayo's civic leaders, including Harry Harwick, the original Mayo Clinic administrator, felt the need to attract additional non-Mayo physicians into the community, but because the current four local hospitals were all closed staff, meaning only Mayo physicians could practice there, it was very hard to attract those extra physicians. It became increasingly difficult to, uh, to attract them to the community, so Harry Hardwick, as well as other civic leaders, decided that they should get a community hospital going, which would be open to other physicians. In 1947, the referendum was passed to permit the three-quarter million dollar bond to build that hospital. Unfortunately, the site originally picked near Bear Creek flooded the next year, so they decided that wasn't the best place to build that hospital. And, and it took them a while to figure out an alternative site. Eventually, the state gave the county a portion of the hospital land, and construction went underway in 1954. The community hospital opened in 1955. to see this younger picture of himself, but <laughs> he's aged very well. Meanwhile, he's still living? He actually is. He lives here in Rochester. Uh, he, he winters down in Florida with his wife, but they I see them at least once a year at a founders event that we hold. A lot of the, the original founding members come back for that, and it is a wonderful treat to listen to them tell the stories and to see each other. They, they see each other at least that once a year, which is, which is neat. Dr. Harold Wente, who had married a lady from Rochester, I'm sorry if I'm in your way, I'll move, <coughs> do a little dance of your mother. Dr. Harold Wente had married a lady from Rochester, had finished his training, and was reviewing practice opportunities. 
Dr. Wente states that some Mayo Clinic internal medicine physicians told him about the community hospital and that he and his wife were really excited about that. They had not considered Rochester <coughs> as a site to practice because they knew that the hospitals were all close to Mayo Clinic physicians. And Elaine's parents were excited because that meant the grandchildren would be living a lot closer. And Dr. Wente also recalls that the babysitting potential of those same grandparents was a nice deliberation when they were looking at where they were going to start. Dr. Wente then met with Harry Harwick, the then administrator of the Mayo Clinic, and he was told that Mayo Clinic administration was very supportive of the hospital. The next day, Dr. Wente learned that Dr. Wellner, who was the only full-time practicing physician in Rochester at the time, was moving from the Lawler office building to the new First National Bank building. Dr. Wente ordered just over $1,000 worth of medical equipment to start his medical practice. And I'm sure that wouldn't get you very far today, but it was an exam table, uh, waiting <coughs> chairs, a doctor's bag, etc. He also ordered an $1,800 x-ray machine which, again, wouldn't get you very far today with an x-ray machine. His wife's uh, family had a plumbing shop years ago. Did they? Yeah. 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 Daily is her maiden? Uh, yeah. I know she she is a sure relative to the gentleman who owned the Lawler building, where he first practiced. Mm -hmm. She's a Daly? Lawler. Right, she's, she's, she's really... Mm -hmm. I was going to they're all... The, the Lawlers, the Daly's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I learned that I actually thought she was a Lawler, and then I found out later that, that she was just related to the gentleman. I knew there was a connection with the building. She was at our class in school. Oh, really? She's a wonderful lady. I've met her every, every July I see her. So she and Hal. Um, on July 15, 1949, Dr. Wendy opened his practice in Dr. Wellner's former location at the, at the uh, Lawler building, overlooking the busiest intersection in downtown Rochester, and I believe I would still say that's one of the busiest intersections in the town. It is located where the Michaels restaurant parking lot is now. Elaine was his receptionist for a few hours every day. And Dr. Winter remembers in the early days that he and Elaine would listen for the creaking on the stairs, and then they tried to figure out if it was a potential patient coming in or someone coming for insurance, or um, the license across the hall, some other nearby tenants. He had two patients on his first day for a grand total of four dollars in cash. In August, he hired his first employee, and she was his receptionist, lab tech, bookkeeper, and nurse. And as you can see, when he opened up his practice, he did receive congratulations from many people, including Dr. Charles Mayo. By 1951, his practice had taken off. He was seeing 30 patients a day, 22 in the office, and 8 on house calls. From the beginning, he offered insurance exams. They were usually paid for in cash, and then he got to meet the up-and-coming businessmen of the community. So kind of a, a nice team there. This is something you don't see anymore as house call attire, but that's what, that's what Dr. Wente Did you really? No. Oh, really? He he was, told me a story about the the hat that there was a furrier that was in this either the same building or a nearby building, and he got the, that's who he got that from. But he he said that's that's actually what he titles that picture is his house call attire for the winter. He recalls that the city provided him with a private parking spot just outside his door so he could perform house calls whenever he had a break in between his patients. His parking spot had a police sign that said no parking, physician, and that not even the mayor received that courtesy. His house calls were all over the area from Pine Island to Yoda to Stewartville and to Castle. 
Dr. Wendy remembers his, his greatest medical experience happened on those house calls. The start of Olmsted Medical Group began in, Ju in June of 1952 when Dr. Wendy was joined by Dr. James Doyle. The office was more crowded then. It was a one-person office. So they took turns making house calls so there would be one in the office and one out seeing the other patients. Their medical record and bookkeeping system was done by putting Dr. Wendy's records in blue or in green ink, or doc, sorry, Dr. Wendy's records in blue ink and Dr. Doyle's in green. Their financial and medical information for the patients was put on a five by eight in, uh, index card. Their after hours call system was a private phone line with an emergency number in Dr. Wendy's home with an extension phone in Dr. Doyle's home. And their simple way of, of uh, dealing with call was whoever was off call would just simply unplug the phone. And they used that system until there were four physicians in the company. When it was time to name the business, the doctors agreed that the word Rochester and clinic would confuse people with the Mayo Clinic. The current Mayo Clinic administrator suggested that they call themselves a group rather than a clinic. They decided to pick Olmsted after the county medical group. Several years, years later, the surgeons led a drive to change it to the Olmsted Medical and Surgical Group. And then years later, it was changed back to just simply Olmsted Medical Group for marketing reasons. Some of you may recognize this building. <laughs> You've been there. After looking at dozens of locations for the new business, Dr. Wenke finally decided that the new building would be on 3rd Avenue Southeast, where the current building still stands. Dr. Panetta has a podiatry clinic mm -hmm. in that location. And it's actually on the same block as Olmsted Medical Center is located now. It was six blocks from the prospective hospital site, but remember, that one got moved because of the flood. A partnership was formed called Medical Properties, which included Dr. Wenke, Dr. Doyle, Olmsted Medical Group's attorney, and the attorney's brother. They all invested in this new building and the land. When the building was completed in 1953, visitors from all over the Midwest came to see this structure because buildings built specifically for physicians weren't very common, and so the publicity was very good. Even Hubert H. Humphrey came. Dr. Wendy had some dealings with him from a political area, and so he came and autographed a picture. Before the 3rd Avenue building was vacated, there were three additions made to the building because OMG's business was growing so fast. At this location, Drs. Wendy and Doyle designed a code using four different colored light bulbs that were put outside the exam rooms. Those lights or combination of those lights would tell the doctors and nurses exactly where the patient was in the in the process. Was there a patient in there? Whose patient was it? Did, did they need lab tests? They also used a three-part chart holder system outside the door. That in combination with the lights told them even more. When the building kept growing, the lighting system got more and more expensive to maintain, so they switched to a colored flag system that we still use today. We still use those same three-part chart holders. I haven't figured out the codes yet, but every, every uh, department has a different code as to this flag means this physician, uh, two flags means this physician, so they know exactly what rooms they're going to, and it's, it, it works very, very well. So if you look at the building now, you will see a, a bigger building than they originally had built. And some of you, I'm sure, will remember this time. In the mid-1950s, the group gave, gave shot clinics, or immunization clinics, is what we would call it today, for polio vaccines in the evenings. Dr. Wendy states that the lines were long, the patients paid in cash, it provided PR, and brought a lot of the city to that new 3rd Avenue building. The early success of Olmsted Medical Group was in part due to the vision, energy, and personality of Dr. Wendy. He established a multi-specialty group that throughout the years has been at the forefront of developments in the medical care delivery. 
1963, Olmsted Medical Group became one of the first incorporated group practices of the country, and because of that, one of the first to be able to offer a retirement plan to its employees and other fringe benefits long before those plans became legally recognized. The group was one of the first to computerize its business systems and one of the first to develop satellite community satellite clinics in nearby communities, beginning with St. Charles in 1972. It was one of the first to have a medical director to become accredited, to have an organized quality assurance program, and to establish a patient education department. The cars don't look like that at Miracle Mile right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OMG had 11 physicians and opened a satellite clinic at the Miracle Mile Mall which was brand new at that time, in 1957. According to Dr. Wente, it was the first satellite of a group practice in the United States, so they received national publicity for that. The company Medical Properties, which had purchased that Third Avenue building, also purchased land in the Northwest Rochester and built the Hillcrest Shopping Center. So after the Hillcrest building was completed, they opened a satellite building there, and they moved the patient records and their patients to what they were calling the new Northwest office. Not to be confused with our current Northwest office. In 1963, OMG changed from a partnership to a professional association. So it was known as Olmsted Medical Group Professional Association Corporation. And it was started the profit sharing plan for all its employees. In 1964, 15 years after Dr. Wenke's business first started, OMG had three buildings and 13 physicians. Now I'm not going to expect you to read this. Dr. Banfield is actually practicing as a solo practitioner right now. At the time of this article, and for many years after that, he actually worked at Olmsted Medical Group. So don't get confused if you see Dr. Banfield or hear me mention it. In 1970, Drs. Wente and Banfield of the then Olmsted Medical Group, Olmsted Medical and Surgical Group, were the first two physicians in Rochester to be certified as family physicians by the then new American Medical Association Specialty Board. Now we require that of our physicians that they all be board certified. Nineteen seventy also marked a fairly significant move in OMG's history. <clears throat> it was the year we built a one point two million dollar building on 9th Street Southeast, which is where the main clinic is currently still located. And it doesn't look quite like that anymore. <laughs> They had an open house for the new building. Approximately 2,000 people came to see the new building to look at the telelift system, which we still use today. It, it carried the medical records on a trolley type system throughout the building. We still use it. I've, I've always wanted to have a, an artist, uh, some kind of an art class, paint them to make them little trains or something for the kids to. To watch, especially when the when the ceilings are being worked on, and you can see the tracks, you can see more of the the trolleys going around. Mm -hmm. So that telelift system we still use today. When it breaks down, you'll see employees carrying a lot of charts. It it saves a lot of people a lot of work by using that system. In 1972, the St. Charles office was OMG's first satellite clinic. <coughs> this move guaranteed quality medical care to rural communities and ensured that the physicians in those rural communities were given good employee benefits and had ample learning opportunities. If anybody has any questions along the way, you're welcome to ask. How many physicians do they have now? 120. Actually, we define it as a clinician. A little different. It's, it's physicians, it's nurse practitioners, it's physicians assistants. Um, it's 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 licensed licensed providers, healthcare providers probably an easier way to look at it. 
true physicians, like with an MD or a DO, we probably have 85 in the practice currently. 85, 90, somewhere around there. In 1984, OMG's new logo was unveiled, and I'm sure most of you probably recognize that. I still see that on forms. The new logo used the soft brown colors to represent the warm and personalized care that OMG gave. At that time, it had 11 specialties, 52 doctors, 80 other staff, and three branch offices. In 1983, there were changes in Medicare, and there was a large shift nationwide for more outpatient surgeries to be performed. So small hospitals like the Olmsted Community Hospital were seriously threatened by the lack of patients that were going to be staying in the building. It was felt that the only way for the hospital to survive was for Olmsted Medical Group to increase both the number of patients it cared for and the number of specialties it, served, it offered. Under the leadership of Thomas Hollitz, Administrator, and Dr. G. Richard Geyer, President, from 1986 to 1990, the group more than doubled in size in those four years, adding a number of new specialties as well as six new branch offices. And then we see third floor. The main Rochester office was enlarged to add a third floor in 1987 with a $1.8 million addition. At that time, it had 60 physicians, 110 staff, and five branch offices. In 1988, the group became not-for-profit and had 300 employees with eight branch offices. Uh, that uh, statement just made about becoming not-for-profit, what was that all about? It was a, Why did they do that? Was it previously for-profit? It was previously. Were they, were they generating a profit year by year, and were the owners taking money profit out? And yes, it was a partnership. It was so a partnership. Mm -hmm. It was a professional. It was a corporation. Yeah. But there was there was a group of shareholders and everything in it, and then they decided to be become a not for profit. So instead. it was a limited partnership. Then? I mean, for what, like, I don't know. Well, I don't know how many people. partners were there? At that time, I believe, let's see, how many? I mean, were we talking like four or five, or were we talking? No, there were there were more. They, they actually had rules to how long the physicians had been there that they were able to become. There was the original group, but then they were adding people on in kind of like a seniority um, or a vested kind of a level. Yeah, yeah. like lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. When they... I was going to say, that's, that's more than I know about the... Yeah, okay, well, I was just curious as to then why, why did they decide to go not for profit? They felt it was the best move for the organization as, a, as an organization, not necessarily for them as, as shareholders. And actually, this next part, in, the, in 1993, they became an, uh, a 501c3 and were tax exempt. And that's what this, this piece, mm -hmm. this post bulletin article is about is actually tied it tied together. The clinicians or the physicians at that time gave up the ownership of the corporation, but they kept the organization financially healthy. Actually, according to this, there was uh, 200,000 200, was the average that they gave up at that time for their, their interest for, an, for each person. It provided more stability in the healthcare and the turmoil of the healthcare industry and gave everyone greater job security just by being a, a not for profit and a 501c3. And what year did they go to that? 1993. Okay. And then everybody was on salary. They were all they were all on defined salaries. Mm -hmm. They switched to a production system, which is what we currently do is a is a production system to base their salaries on. Trying to think in either the late '60s or early '70s, they had switched to that that type of a system rather than just a flat salary fee. In the beginning, we still do that. When a when a new physician comes on board, there's usually a base salary because they're building their practice and they're not going to have a full schedule that first day or the first week or anything. So there's usually a set amount of time that they're paid the base salary, and then after that, it goes on production. 
and they have ratios to each department. And it's a very complicated system. And now you mentioned computers yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. What was your first computer, and what computers do you have now? I actually don't know what their first system was. Okay. Um, I've been there eight years. What we have now is Windows. We are an IBM system. We have Windows 2000 software. We use Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, uh, Excel, and the. So you're using personal computers. We we definitely do. We have we have servers that yeah. have all the like the patient information on them. We have an AS400 system over at the hospital. And in the, Yes. Is that good? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's a Rochester product. You got some, ah. you got some AS 400 biggest I was going to say, I, I don't use the hospital system. I don't know the first thing about the hospital system. At the clinic, we actually have an HBOC product, and the companies, the, the heads of those two companies, actually, they just recently merged probably a year ago or so. So we're hoping in the future the two systems will be able to talk. Right now, they are two entirely different systems. Right, AS 400 at the hospital, and then... And then we have an HBOC product at the at the clinic. HBOC, and I it, it's the initials of the company HBOC. that it's a it's their software that's on it. Okay, I understand. You you bought a third party software. System right. Or right. And right now, that although we've been associated for many years, the two computer systems don't talk, which is infuriating to staff as well as patients. Sometimes we've actually. We are limited right now as to what we can integrate back and forth. Like, for example, if you update your insurance at one location, it doesn't automatically update at the other. And, and hopefully There's good the news on the horizon. My friend Charlie just gave me an article from Business Week about what IBM is doing mm -hmm. with what's called e-service on demand. And uh, so the good news is you should be able, if you get together with IBM, uh, global services, they should be able to get you a nice system where everything deals with everything and they'll do it on a turnkey basis. See, and that's the, the two companies so check are it out. <laughs> The softwares that we have at both locations, actually their companies have now merged and they're going they're going to in their very near future going to come up with products so that their, their softwares talk to each other anyway. So we're hopefully looking in the very near future at having, having that happen. Well, you want to be careful with that because you want to get somebody who will provide you with a service where you have lots of backup and oh, yes. ability to grow as you go along. Absolutely. That's why I'm suggesting you look at IBM mm -hmm. Global Services. Thank you. And he doesn't get a commission. Uh, no, I'm, he doesn't. I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> We're all retired. Now, the, the trickiest thing about me doing this presentation is to try to figure out how to incorporate both worlds because they both were evolving over the same years. We, we define our early years as 1949, which is the day Dr. Wenke opened his practice, only because the hospital wasn't built until 55. When I, was, when I was doing this presentation, I struggled with how do I work in. I tried it chronologically, and it didn't go very smoothly. So. After Olmsted Medical Group, and I eventually become a not-for-profit and they were tax-exempt and everything, at the same time now to revert back to the hospital, the hospital had been growing very strong. In 1955, on June 20th, it opened its doors for business. Dr. Charles Mayo was one of the presenters at the dedication ceremony, which again shows Mayo's support for this hospital. The hospital provided independent Rochester and area physicians with a hospital for their own patients. Primarily, before that, they had had to refer their patients to Mayo, and then they were they were seen by the Mayo physicians. If they had to be hospitalized or have surgeries in this area, they, they had to become a Mayo Clinic patient at that point. So this provided a lot of physicians with an alternative and the patients as well. The ER staff at the hospital was staffed primarily by OMG physicians, and for many years, the doctors actually came in when there was an emergency. They weren't there on site, they came in, and they also made house calls in the evening time. So apparently that shift was, was not the best shift because it was a little bit busy and they were all making house calls in the middle of the night. Do you still make house calls? No. <laughs> <laughs> not unless you know them really, really well. And, and Dr. Wente actually says that's one of the things, he said you can't go back. He said that's not, 
at all the best thing to do at this point, but he thinks that, that current physicians really lost out on a piece of the medical. He, he describes it as his best learning experiences were in some of those house calls, so he thinks there's a piece missing, but also understands it's probably not a good idea to go back. It's better to be in the Exactly. Yeah, you can only get house calls by physicians these days if they're your friends or your relatives or something like that. Otherwise, you are, you are on your own. In 1968, and I can't, when did you say you started there, Tommy? Must be in the 80s. Yeah, I think just Okay. We have a retired OMC employee here, so I told her if I mess up, she can just speak up. And <laughs> 20 years at the hospital, 20 plus years at the hospital. In 1968, the hospital had an $850,000 addition that provided the new obstetrical wing, which is what we call the birth center, and a second operating room. In 1979, they got a $1.3 million update that renovated the medical, surgical, and special care units. In 1980, 25 years after it opened, the auxiliary was honored with 25 years of providing service, I'm pleased to say that the auxiliary is still going strong at the hospital. They they provide a lot of equipment, a lot of funds to the to the hospital needs and the staff needs and the patient needs there. So, in 1987, the hospital had until just recently its last um, update. It was 6.3 million dollars, and it was an expansion as well as an update. This is a 1985 picture. Just like the group, getting a little bit bigger all the way along. When Olmsted Medical Group was expanding by adding the new physicians and the new specialties, the hospital did not attract other physicians to Rochester as the group constituted about the entire medical staff of the hospital. The hospital and the group had become a health system because we were so integrated at that time with two heads that didn't always work very well together. Each institution had to look out for his own interest, no matter how hard they wanted to cooperate. After the group became not-for-profit, it was politically feasible to look at a merger. The process began in early 1994, and it was completed with an agreement in late 1995, and that's when I was actually employed by them. The process was especially dif difficult because OMG was a private corporation and Olmsted Community Hospital was owned by the county. And as, as I was explaining to, uh, to one of the folks here, it was things that you don't think of like benefits. Para was one of the benefits of the county employees at that time, but as a private corporation, OMG could not, could not contribute or do anything with Para because that was, you had to, you had to be a different kind of an agency to do that. So something that you take very for granted, we had to come up with a different benefit plan. There's actually a, a, a tiered benefit plan for those folks who were in the para plan, and then they they merged what was the county insurance plan and our plan. They tried to come up with the best of, of each of the worlds so that nobody would lose a lot out of it. And um, it it was a long eight months before that I said if I can survive that I can survive pretty much anything because it was a very busy time in administration at that time uh, prior to the merger and, and soon after the merger. On January 1st, 1996, the hospital was transferred from the county to Olmsted Medical Group's ownership and the new organization was named Olmsted Medical Center. The new logo combined the Olmsted Medical Group and Olmsted Community Hospital's logo between the words Olmsted Medical Center so that people, the public would start to comprehend that although we had always been viewed as one organization before, we finally were one. So that's what the the logo looked like for about a year and a half to try to get people to start understanding that it was, oh, I'm sorry, that's very low. So we, we deliberately put those two logos in between to show that we are now one, one company. In 1997, we created a new logo, which is the current logo. We had 26 specialties by that time. 
1998, the Northwest office opened in Rochester, and it was our 11th branch office. In 1999, we celebrated 50 years. Had a, had a brochure made that had a 50 year logo on it, 1949 to 1999. The main clinic added its fourth and final floor. Due to building constraints, we cannot go any higher. We're actually four feet above the maximum, and the neighbor had, neighbors had to agree that we could go those extra four feet. So we can go no higher in that building. Therefore, in 2000, we started leasing space nearby. We actually leased four different buildings nearby because we have continued to grow and we can't go any higher. And as of yet, it's not financially feasible to go out in the, building, in the main clinic building. In 2000, I was also asked to join the, the Chief Administrative Officer and President to explore the possibility of creating a foundation for Olmsted Medical Center. And as Jane Campion knows, because Jane is on our board, in August 2001, OMC created a separate corporation known as the OMC Regional Foundation. The foundation's vision for the future is to support needed health care services for businesses, families, and neighbors requiring specific equipment or personnel, health and wellness education to everyone from youth to seniors, and programs stressing preventative health care in the OMC communities. In addition, they are going to strive to connect with the citizens of the community the OMC serves by being a bridge between the OMC patients and the health care providers. And if I can get the, if I can get this thing working, I'll shut this one off. I'm going to show a, a brief video about the foundation. Uh, before you do that, could I ask one more question? <laughs> oh, that's all right. all right. Well, I just wondered, today, if you, in the hospital that you own, what kind of surgeries do you do and what kind of surgeries do you not do? We have, we, have, we do surgeries that are performed by ENT physicians, uh, urology, um, GYN, orthopedics, surgery? yes. We do prostate surgery. We do not have a cardiologist on staff, so we do not do cardiology surgeries. Okay. Uh, we have a general surgeons that do appendix, tonsillectomy, what am I missing mm -hmm. here? Podiatry, um, uh, eyes. We have plastic surgery we recently added. Okay. Um, what else am I missing? Right, general surgery is dual. Any of that kind of surgery? They do, they do quite a variety yeah. of surgeries, actually. I They're what I think of when I think of a surgeon is, is what they do. Earlier you mentioned you had some DOs on the staff. Is that osteopathy? Yes, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of an MD. It's just a different type of schooling. Well, Doctor of osteopathy. Some might argue about that. But <laughs> well, and I, and why, and there are MDs who will argue about that. do you have and why do you have them? We have, um, <coughs> I think it's three, three or four. Okay. It, is, it is by far a minority. There are just not as many people that go to that type of schooling as go to the traditional MD schooling. Well, um, the ones that we have are fantastic. I don't, I don't know why they choose the different ones, but there's, there's, there's probably three or four of them out of 85. And the rest of them are all MDs. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now if I can get this technology to work for me. Everybody see that? Oops. A history of community service. An agenda of caring. Olmstead Medical Center, your health care partner. Olmstead Medical Center is a leader in Minnesota health care. Combining healthcare technology with first-rate personnel and a commitment to patient comfort, service, and satisfaction, our mission is quality. Olmstead Medical Center is an integrated, not-for-profit healthcare organization committed to providing the highest quality patient-focused medical, surgical, obstetrical, and psychological services. Services are delivered efficiently by professionals in locations that are accessible at hours that are convenient, 
and in a manner that is highly valued by patients, employers, and payers in southeastern Minnesota. Our core values reflect our mission and echo our tradition of service and excellence. Our patients come first. Our employees are the key to our success. We are an active, contributing partner in the communities we serve. And we have a duty to maintain Olmsted Medical Center for the future. Our patients have always been our highest priority. We take the time to get to know our patients and their families, their health care concerns, and their special needs. We do much more than treat the illness or the injury. We treat the person. And this has been our approach ever since we first opened our doors over 50 years ago. At the end of World War II, there were only three clinicians in Olmsted County who were not employed by the Mayo Clinic, and civic leaders felt the need to attract more to the community. However, they recognized that a community hospital would be necessary to attract high-quality health care professionals. In 1947, a referendum was passed to permit a three-quarter million dollar county bond issue to build a hospital. Construction began in 1954, and the Olmsted Community Hospital opened its doors in June of 1955. Lured by the promise of a new hospital, Dr. Harold Wente founded what would become the Olmsted Medical Group in 1949. And by the time the new hospital opened, Dr. Wente's practice had expanded to include two more family practitioners, a surgeon, an obstetrician, and an ophthalmologist. As Rochester and the surrounding communities grew, so too did the hospital and Dr. Wente's group. In fact, the Olmsted Medical Group became one of the first incorporated group practices in the country in 1963. And over the next several decades, grew into one of the most groundbreaking, innovative, multi-specialty practices in the nation. By the 1980s, however, the group had outgrown the model of a professional corporation, so it became a not-for-profit organization in 1988, and a 501c3 <coughs> corporation in 1993. Then, on January 1st, 1996, the hospital and the group merged to form the Olmsted Medical Center. Today, the Olmsted Medical Center's patient visits total 450,000 each year. It performs 3,100 major surgical operations, cares for 19,000 patients in its emergency department, and delivers 900 babies per year. The center offers health care services in the areas of adolescent medicine, allergy, anesthesiology, audiology, dermatology, ear, nose, and throat, emergency medicine, family medicine, general surgery, internal medicine, lifestyle management, neurology, obstetrics gynecology, occupational medicine, ophthalmology, orthopedic surgery, patient education, pediatrics, plastic surgery, podiatry, psychiatry and psychology, radiology, research, sports medicine, and urology. And as a major employer in southeastern Minnesota, the center employs nearly 900 people, including over 100 clinicians practicing in Rochester and in neighboring communities, as well as at our hospital. Um, our focus, our mission is to, um, to be very family-oriented in the, in the care we provide. We are a community health care organization. Uh, we focus on our families serving um, the, our, our patients' families, um, whether that be in our rural communities, whether it be in the urban markets of Rochester, and our hospitals, our emergency room, or our, our primary care clinics. What makes Olmsted Medical Center unique, though, is our outstanding service philosophy. With convenient office hours, including evenings, weekends, and holidays, and 24-hour emergency care at our hospital, we ensure that medical attention is available when you need it. And in addition to our hospital and main clinic in Rochester, Olmsted Medical Center invests in a regional philosophy, offering convenient health care to communities throughout southeastern Minnesota through a broad network of branch offices. These fully staffed offices provide a complete array of services designed to meet the primary care needs of their communities. They are located in northwest Rochester, Byron, Chatfield, Pine Island, Plainview, Preston, St. Charles, Spring Valley, Stewartville, and Wanamingo. 
In each of these communities, Olmstead Medical Center offers the very highest quality health care and customer-friendly service. Smaller, welcoming environments, more personalized care, and convenient access to your family physician, resulting in outstanding primary care with coordinated referrals to our specialists when required. However, just as it has in the 50 plus years since Olmstead Medical Center first opened its doors, the healthcare delivery field continues to change. Where do I see healthcare going into the future? Um, I see the technology will continue. Uh, there will be a continued demand for services. People will want more services. The challenge that we face, in part, is how to continue to do the service under the uh, continued financial pressures that we have, and yet keep the same high quality and convenient service that we've been known for in the past. With the future of healthcare upon us, the OMC Regional Foundation has been established to help Olmstead Medical Center meet the capital needs of its growing organization for new or expanded facilities medical equipment, and program development, as well as provide cutting-edge services and appropriate technologies. The mission of the Foundation is to advocate for and support Olmstead Medical Center and assist in funding quality health care services and education programs in the communities it serves. Uh, Olmstead Medical Center has been very focused on its long-term strategic planning initiatives. We want to make sure we have the right <coughs> facilities, technology, and resources both physicians and support staff to meet the growing needs of the populations that we serve. The Foundation's support will allow Olmstead Medical Center to expand programming in a number of ways that are critical to fulfilling its health care mission. The Foundation will allow the Center to provide more health care education opportunities, to continue to invest in its branch office communities throughout southeastern Minnesota, to build greater partnerships with industries, organizations, and individuals, and to expand its research on rural health care issues. Foundation was created for a number of reasons. Um, the two come to mind to me, particularly. Um, one is technology. In order to keep up with the fast-changing medical te technology, uh, we're going to need to invest more in um, equipment and, and procedures. Secondly is the investment in the communities in which we serve with an aging population. They're going to have increasing um, educational needs. Olmstead Medical Center has always been a good neighbor in Rochester and its branch office communities, and we have appreciated the outpouring of goodwill and support that we have enjoyed from those communities throughout the years. Now, the OMC Regional Foundation needs your friendship as we work to provide Olmstead Medical Center with the tools and investments it needs to continue providing top quality health care services to southeastern Minnesota. Foundations are about helping people understand the joy of giving. And if you can help people understand that uh, sense of the grateful heart for, um, for care that might have been provided for a newborn or for a, a child or for an aging parent or whoever, whoever might have been served, um, and, and people want to express themselves, and that, that's an opportunity for them to express themselves. Gifts accepted by the Foundation include cash contributions, stocks, bonds, insurance policies, real estate, and personal property. OMC Regional Foundation will provide another source of capital funds that, that we need to, to support Olmstead Medical Center into the future. It's sort of a reflection of the generosity of spirit of the Olmstead Medical Center, and it's a reflection of the generosity of the people who have care. And what we want to do with the foundation is we really want to make a difference. And not just Rochester, we're talking regional. And that's what I love about Olmstead Medical Center. We'll be in the communities of all sizes providing these services. And that's where OMC sees its mission. It is only through the generosity of our citizens that we can ensure that Olmstead Medical Center will continue to be there for you, your family, your friends, and your neighbors when you need it. With your help and support, Olmstead Medical Center will always be there for us.
I'm sure you probably, if you're here in the back, you probably, or behind the podium, you probably can't see the picture of the hospital there. Those are those are both the most current ones I can find. So, and that is actually what they look like. Today, under the leadership of Kevin Pitzer, Chief Administrative Officer, and Dr. Noel Peterson, our President, Homestead Medical Center employs about 925 people, including about 120 clinicians practicing in Rochester and nine neighboring communities, as well as the hospital. The organization is governed by a board of trustees consisting of 10 public members, five clinicians, the chief administrative officer, and the chief medical officer. The trustees' function is to serve the see that public interest is served. The Board of Governors makes up a made up of clinicians and the Chief Administrative Officer govern the actual operations. And you saw the information about the, how many patients we see, how many surgeries we provide. It said 900 babies per year. This last year we crested 1,000. OMC continues to carefully add medical specialties to the practice, most recently plastic surgery in a sleep study lab. And although both the main clinic and hospital have gone through remodeling projects over the last several years, OMC is currently exploring expansion possibilities again at the hospital. OMC's core values continue to reflect the values of its early founders. One, our patients come first. We try to provide high quality services and are attentive to cost, convenience, and patient comfort. Two, our employees are the key to our success. All employees, regardless of their function, contribute to our patient care. Three, OMC is an active contributing partner in the communities it's located in by sponsoring community activities and other not-for-profit organizations. And we do sponsor the Roosters baseball team. We have a duty to maintain OMC for the future, and that's where the foundation comes in. In conclusion, starting from one general practitioner and the dream of a new hospital, Olmstead Medical Center has grown and prospered and become a major resource for health care in southeastern Minnesota. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak today. And do you have any questions? I have I had one question. Yes. And it's it's not a burning question, but I know some people have uh, discussions and debates about this. Have you ever done any marketing studies? To determine why, you know, here we, we're sitting, we got Mayo Clinic and we got Olmstead Medical Group. Mm -hmm. Why people decide to go to one place or another? Honestly, right now, insurance drives a lot of it. A lot of our patients either coming in or going out the door, the reason they're switching is because their insurance carriers are saying, you have to go here, you have to go there. We have or a lot you have some groups that require them to go to Exactly, Olmstead. exactly. And, and, oh, and there is, there is a, a significant number of insurance companies that, that have them start at our place. Um, it's, it, it just kind of depends. I, I know friends and, and relatives who have had to switch just because their insurance coverage plans have told them they have to switch. Or if they come to us, they're going to pay 50% instead of 20%. Uh, I do know of Mayo Clinic patients who have come and paid $2,500 out of pocket to have a baby in our birth center. So you have to decide where, where your money goes and what's most important to you, and, and insurance and the cost of, of medical care just drive, definitely drives a lot of it. But it's, we actually, when people try to compare us, we aren't comparable. We are two totally in, different institutions with right. two totally different plans, and, and we work extremely well together. Um, they, they need us to provide the specialties and the primary cares because their subspecialties are funded and, and we funnel the patients if they need, for example, cardiology. We don't provide that. If we have a patient needing cardiology service, we're going to refer them to Mayo Clinic. And, and, and their deeper levels of subspecialties require that, that patient flow. And, and we are definitely a, a solid provider for them. And we've gotten along very well for a lot of years. And, and as you can see, even from the beginning, they were very supportive of this and knew, knew that there was a need for it. So clearly the demand is there, and I, I think you've got a couple other things going. These rural, uh, you know, sub groups that mm -hmm. you have are providing a need that, mm -hmm. you know, for local people out in the rural communities uh, is one thing. And I think another factor is that some people would like smaller rather than larger. Exactly. Know, Mayo Clinic is 
wonderful, but it's an overwhelming it's intimidating. sort when, of place. When my mother-in-law came here the first time, she had never ridden in an elevator before. She came from an extremely mm -hmm. small town, and the idea of going to a 14-story building with an elevator petrified her. Um, actually, when we have done surveys in the past, the thing people like the best is the free convenient parking. That's that is number one on the list. And, and, and when we've talked about growth and we've talked about, yes, but if we do that, then we'll need a parking ramp, then we say, but wait. Free convenient parking doesn't mean parking ramps. And, and, and actually, that has been, that's a controversy, you know, because that's what people think of us is the pull up, you go in, you're the face, uh, you know, you're the name. And, and, and I actually was a patient long before I was an employee, and I never would have become an employee if I wouldn't have been such a happy patient. It looked like you were doing some construction again on the east side of the building. What's going on Which, now? The hospital. Actually, what's going on at the hospital is we are updating some uh, um, CT and an MRI systems, and for them to do the remodeling for that extensive of a yeah. system, the unit yeah. has to go down for a month, and we can't afford to go down. So what we have is a, a mobile unit. There's a You will see a trailer parked right outside the, the old um, main entrance. And, and then they've got a temporary hallway set up so that a covered, a covered walkway so that people aren't walking out in the cold and are, or walking out exposed to the, to the elements. And, and it's going to be there for a month because that's the only way we could continue to keep our patients and, and the flow of that uh, department going. So we actually have something parked there for a month. And then by then the staff will be retrained on the new system, we'll have the new equipment in, all the remodeling will be done, and then the trailer will weigh and we'll be back to it. But the, like the MRI, we can actually do twice as many now. They, uh, the system we have now required, if, if the test was say six minutes, then the system would sit there and churn for another six minutes to actually get the data out. And now, as soon as one test is finished, it actually churns on another computer, on another system. The technology's changed just in the last like, four years to where now we can have it compiling information on one and doing another test. So we can literally double the number of exams we do, which is good because we're starting to back up in that area. So, yes, sir. Uh, just wondering, on uh, these outlying areas, uh, does the uh, clinic co-share some of those locations with you? Or do they? Mayo Clinic? Yeah. No. Or do they see, you know, that that community is already provided with coverage and they go someplace else? There is only one we have dual coverage in and that's plain view. Plain view. Everyone else, either they are the sole provider or we are the sole provider. Okay. And actually if you look at Rochester from a target, because we started the satellites first, if you look at Rochester as the center of a target, we are both obviously located in Rochester and the next ring of the target is OMC communities. The next ring outside of that is Mayo. So us going out further isn't probably going to happen because Mayo Clinic has a great deal with like Austin and Albert Lee and Owatonna and you know, some of those. They've got that next ring. We do, we are constantly considering communities. We have communities come to us and say we want you to open up a branch office in our area and unfortunately it's just not that easy to say great we'll, you know, we'll open next week. There's a lot of research that has to be done. There's one community that wants us, but at the same time, almost every single person that lives in that town is, is a Mayo Clinic employee. <laughs> Chances are good, they're not going to come to us, you know, and so it, it just wouldn't make financial sense for us to move into that branch office, and it would, it would be setting it up for failure. And actually, we, a few years ago, moved our Elgin office to Plainview because even those, those extra seven miles, over well over 50% of the patients in the Elgin office were coming from Plainview, and the Elgin office couldn't grow. It, it, it was not expandable. And so by moving those seven miles, they were able to get a, a much bigger property and get closer to the majority of their patients. So we, we do continue to have conversations with other branch off, or with other communities around here, but OMC is not planning on having branch offices like Mayo does in communities where there's a time zone difference. You know, there's um, I've actually talked to some administrators who oversee the branch offices for Mayo, and, and we don't have time zone differences. We don't have um, anything like that where we have to let our bodies adapt to getting to this new culture, and um, it's a little easier for us. But I think also. even Mayo, I think, is expanding too quickly because you get too big, it's harder to control despite all the mm -hmm. modern technology. I think it's better. And, and uh, let's see what it's like. How do you know how many employees are? are 
work day at the clinic every day? The city, the city usually has a good idea. Oh, the city themselves. So someone might say an employer might come to us and um, a, a major employer in a in a town might come to us and say, I want you, especially if their employees come to us a lot, then they want to have their employees driving less, taking less time off of work to bring them themselves or their family members in, and so they might suggest it. But if we go back to the city records and and we figure out that a good portion of them are Mayo Clinic employees, quite honestly. We know that they're not, they're covered under the Mayo Clinic plan probably, and, and, and they can certainly come to us and people do come to us, but we're not going to get enough to make it worthwhile. So we do, we always, we are always doing research if someone, if someone comes to us, we fairly assess whether or not it's going to work. And, um, and we've done really well. So, we're there. I just wanted to make a couple comments. One, I'd like to clarify the not-for-profit kind of issue, I think that really will keep on paying taxes. Health care has been basically a not-for-profit operation, really until about 25 years ago when some of the for-profits began to get into it. The two of them starting out the practice, you know, Dr. Winnie starting out the practice of an individual practitioner, always hoped he made a profit. Mm -hmm. uh, but health services have basically been not for profit, and the idea being that they're.